Доброе утро, глубокоуважаемые преподаватели, студенты и участники сегодняшнего пленарного заседания. Я рад сообщить всем, что успешно проведена в нашем университете 15-я всероссийская 89-я итоговая студенческая научная конференция с международным участием «Студенческая наука и медицина 21 века. Традиции, инновации и приоритеты». Надо сказать, что это знаковая конференция, потому что она проведена в год, объявленную в указе президента Российской Федерации Владимира Владимировича Путина в год науки и технологий. И мы очень рады, что она была проведена с особым вниманием со стороны и преподавателей, и студентов, и в наших заседаниях, в наших секциях участвовали независимые эксперты. Да, сейчас непростое время. В условиях пандемии COVID-19 мы проводим ее в дистанционном формате. Но, как показала конференция, все участники участвовали в ней очно-заочно, неравнодушно интересными обсуждениями, вопросами и активным участием не только студентов нашего университета, но и количество студентов, достаточно много было из других городов, из 22 городов. Было заявлено более 500 студенческих работ, и 80 из них – это работы ребят из других университетов. У нас была проведена очень интересная англоязычная секция, на которой участвовали ребята из таких стран, как Ливия, Индия, Мексика, Грузия, Латвия, Болгария, Казахстан, Беларусь. Мы видим, что география участников из года в год растет. Нас это радует, что говорит о важности и серьезности проведения нашей Всероссийской конференции с международным участием. Успешно были проведены все 21 секции, на которой ребята показали очень глубокие знания, прекрасные презентации, хорошо проработанные. Я хочу поблагодарить и ребят, которые представили эти презентации, и их научных руководителей за очень серьезную совместную работу. И радует, что несмотря на то, что у нас мы живем в условиях пандемии COVID-19, научно-исследовательская деятельность в нашем университете, она не прекращается, а только развивается. И ребята нашли возможность, с одной стороны, бороться и помогать нашей стране справиться с этой пандемией, и с другой стороны, развивать свою научно-исследовательскую деятельность. Ну и позвольте мне... Слово для приветствия предоставить ректору Самарского государственного медицинского университета, профессору РАН Александру Владимировичу Калсанову, который сейчас находится в командировке, но он нашел время поприветствовать участников сегодняшней конференции. Глубоко уважаемые коллеги! Итоговая конференция всегда была главным научным событием в жизни студентов Самарского государственного медицинского университета, неравнодушных к исследованиям, инновациям и научному поиску. В год, объявленным годом науки и технологий, конференция стала центром притяжения одаренной молодежи и их наставников из 22 городов России. Свои работы представили коллеги из таких стран, как Индия, Мексика, Грузия, Латвия, Болгария, Казахстан, Беларусь. Всего заявлено для участия более 500 исследований. Из года в год нам удается повышать эту планку, расширяя географию и тематику исследований. Желаю всем успешных выступлений и плодотворной работы. Уважаемые коллеги, господа студенты, преподаватели, сейчас я хочу предоставить слово Управлению международных отношений 
Татьяне Зебревой. Она представит доклад президента Всемирной Федерации Медицинского образования профессора Дэвида Гордона. Пожалуйста, Татьяна. Доброе утро, дорогие коллеги. Сейчас с нами на связи находится профессор Дэвид Гордон. Как Игорь Леонидович уже представил, он является президентом Всемирной Федерации Медицинского Образования. И сейчас буквально минутка, технические нюансы. Мы подключим профессора, и он готов будет представить свою лекцию. Хочу предупредить, что лекция будет на английском языке, со слайдами на русском языке. И у вас будет возможность задать вопросы профессору в чате, в трансляции на YouTube. First slide. Absolutely perfectly. Thank you. Perfect. Then I think we can start. Right. Uh, right. Thank you. And uh, I, I see that the recording has started, so that's absolutely fine. Uh, it's very nice to be here despite uh, the technical difficulties. And I'm very pleased to have been prompted uh, by the invitation to talk to think a little bit more about the structure that we have that takes the medical student through to the moment when he or she graduates as a medical doctor. Next slide, please. The main argument of this talk, the main uh, point is to talk about the work of the medical school in that transition from medical student to doctor. And I picture the medical student and the doctor as being two pillars that uh, hold together the structure with another five pillars on the way. The teaching staff of the medical school, the um, uh, administration of the school, the dean, rector, um, the uh, healthcare system, the regulator and society in general. And I, I think it's fair to say that medical students are one of the essential drivers of the work of the medical school and I think it's also that essential to say that every one of those pillars that I'm describing has to adapt uh, to deal with any crisis. Next slide please. This is a little bit about the World Federation for Medical Education. Uh, you can see at the very top of the slide in rather faint type that we have the name in all the other official languages of the United Nations. And so the top line has the name of the World Federation in the Russian language. Uh, our job is to try and improve medical education everywhere in the world. We are a non-state actor in official relations with the World Health Organization to represent medical education and medical schools worldwide. And we were founded by the World Health Organization and the World Medical Association uh, uh, nearly 50 years ago. And as I've written in the bold type, we are concerned with the quality, the management, the organization and support of medical education, not in the detail of education. There are other people who are good at that and uh, talking about what should be taught and the educational methods and approaches. But we stand back and look at how the whole system as a whole works. Next slide, please. Uh, next. The governing body is the Executive Council. This is a, a picture from the last time they were able to meet in person. And you can see it is genuinely worldwide from the left, from Nigeria, from the Lebanon, from the United States, from Mexico, from Indonesia, from Korea, and so on. Next. Um, Of the organizations represented there, there's the World Health Organization, as I mentioned. Next, the World Medical Association. Near the top right is Dr. Otmar Kloiber, who is the General Secretary. And the International Federation of Medical Students Associations. And as I was saying yesterday, if you want common sense talked at a, a, a World Federation executive meeting, we will very often turn to the medical student representative Uh, uh, she's the one in the middle of the front row, who very often has the most common sense and the fewest prejudices. Next slide, please. This is my last slide purely in English and is the uh, front of our website. It's very easy to find our website, wfme.org. 
and it lists the three main activities that we have at the moment, looking at the accreditation of medical education, writing standards for medical education, and maintaining the world directory of medical schools. Next slide, please. So this is the track that I'm taking us through, the start and the end of the track, the first and the final pillar, from the medical student to the medical doctor. And in English, we ought to talk about doctors collectively as the medical profession. But next slide, please. What do we mean by a profession? And this is a very old and traditional definition, but I think a very important one. It is an occupation where there is a duty to provide service. Second, it is an occupation that requires specialised knowledge and intensive academic education. And because the knowledge is specialised and not readily accessible to uh, the public, the profession has to uh, regulate itself in part and also be regulated by appropriate laws. Next slide, please. And on that definition, the old professions were only medicine, the law, and the church. And uh, the question is, therefore, when you start as a medical student, are you already in a profession? Uh, and I think you are. You have to meet professional standards. Next slide, please. Now, obviously, when you start at the medical school, the first thing you meet are the teaching staff of the medical school. And they will be the primary contract contact over the next few years. And teaching uh, as a discipline, education as a discipline, is not like um, the sciences of medicine. In anatomy, we know exactly where the branches of the carotid artery are. But in medicine, we have no certainty as to whether a lecture should be given this way or that way, no certainty as to how a curriculum should be constructed. So it is a very um, complicated process to actually bring together the knowledge that you need in medicine and to deliver the education in the most effective way possible. I have only, have only two thoughts to give you about teaching. Next slide, please. Um, the first is from Hippocrates uh, more than two and a half thousand years ago. And uh, in English, this says, I shall hold my teacher in this art, the art of medicine that is, equal to my own parents, to make him partner in my livelihood, and when he's in need of money, to share mine with him. So remember, if your teachers are short of money, you should help them. But a more up-to-date quotation, next please. Sorry, I have a picture of Hippocrates there. We have no idea what he looks like, but there we are, there's a picture. Next. Um, this is a quotation from the World Federation, uh, the, what we actually wrote ourselves, and recognising that medical education is not an evidence-based discipline. It's very difficult to get evidence, but the practices of education tend to follow the socially constructed values and ideas of education. Next, please. The third pillar I'm going to list uh, are, are in this talk is about the administration of the medical school, the rector and his or her team. Now, um, you would expect me to be biased in favour of the rector because I used to be one. Um, but it's often felt that administration is something that doesn't much matter and has to be done, but we should ignore it. And, and it is administration, it is bureaucracy. Is this a good thing or not? And bureaucracy, the creation of administrative structures, is sometimes almost used as a term of uh, criticism. But on the next slide, the next slide, thank you, um, a quotation from Max Weber, who is the father of modern sociology. And on the question of whether administration is a good or a bad thing, he says that Bureaucracy constitutes the most efficient and rational way in which human activity can be organized. Systematic processes and organized hierarchies are necessary to maintain order, to maximize efficiency, and to eliminate favoritism. In other words, the dean is sitting, and his or her team, is sitting behind the teaching staff, is sitting behind what you do as students, 
uh, sitting behind the relationship between the medical school and all the other things, the healthcare system and the politicians, and making sure that the machine works well. Next slide, please. Um, the next pillar that I'm going to put in my structure is the healthcare system, because inevitably, a large part of the medical course is delivered in partnership with the healthcare system. You cannot learn uh, a surgery, medicine, obstetrics, psychiatry without working with patients and with the doctors and other healthcare team who look after those patients. And this raises a very large number of questions. I think it's fair to say that in many medical faculties, the single most uh, important problem for the rector is the relationship with the healthcare system. Next slide, please. And there are a number of uh, questions in the relationship between healthcare and medical education. First of all, where do students study? Obviously, there are teaching hospitals, there will be a teaching hospital or teaching hospitals directly attack, attached to the medical school. Uh, when I was the dean in Manchester, we had three teaching hospitals, uh, but rather than cooperating with each other, they were often fighting. So it was a difficult problem. So there's the teaching hospital, other hospitals, clinics, primary care, health care in the community. And there are a lot of uh, prejudices or beliefs that vary from one country to another. Um, going back to my time in Manchester, we had a very large number of medical students and part of their education was done in one of 300, 300 teaching facilities in primary care. And uh, that meant that we used almost every primary care practitioner in a very wide area around Manchester. But if you were to go to France to say to the dean of a medical school there, you can teach your students in primary care, the dean would throw up his hands in horror and would say, that's impossible. You cannot teach students in primary care. If you go to Germany and say, uh, well, there are teaching hospitals, but you can teach students in other hospitals, they will say, no, uh, it is not possible. It must be only a teaching hospital. And this leads to some very strange circumstances. Um, the hospital in Nuremberg, a great German city, is deemed to be not suitable to teach medical students. Is it good enough to treat the people of Nuremberg, you ask? Well, they say, oh yes, it's good enough for that, but not good enough for medical students. But I think, so we have to understand there are a lot of uh, national uh, feelings about uh, where in the healthcare system you can teach students. The third point on here is the costs uh, of the education in the healthcare system. If you have a hospital with medical students, then there are extra costs in that hospital. You need to take more time with your patient to, to be able to teach. You need more space for students to uh, gather around the patient or to sit and study or all of those things. The hospital library will need to be improved. So there are extra costs in the healthcare system. And in some countries that is explicitly recognized that the uh, hospital that teaches has extra money. Uh, in other countries, there is no extra money at all. It also works the other way, the fourth point, that medical students make considerable contributions to the healthcare system. And if the uh, students are used to their full potential, then there is a lot that can be done to actually help enhance uh, the care of patients. And if anyone is critical ever of a hospital spending time teaching students, there is very solid evidence really very good evidence indeed that a hospital that teaches students provides a much, much better quality of health care. Next slide, please. Um, now the regulator, the body that regulates or that controls uh, education, medical education and it's in and the way the whole thing works. And this is an area where, as we stand back for actual education, but look at how it's managed, regulation is an area where the World Federation has a great deal of activity. 
Next slide, please. Now, um, the, what does the regulator do? Well, if you have a country with no regulator, no one verifying that medical schools, schools are working well and are working to the right standard, then the quality of medical education falls. There may be corruption. There may be poor quality doctors and bad health care. And I have pictures of medical schools in some parts of the world where there is no good regulator, which are horrifyingly bad. You would not imagine how bad they can be. Who should be responsible for this? Well, that is a very much a cultural matter. Uh, it may be the government. It may be the medical profession itself, or it may be an autonomous organization. It will not surprise you, for example, on cultural grounds that in the People's Republic of China, there is no question that the regulation of medical education will be done by the government. And I have to say it is done extremely well. It's run by a very, very able team of young people um, led by a very clever woman uh, who makes sure that medical schools in China are really excellent. It might well be the profession. If you look at how medical schools in the Czech Republic are regulated, that is very much up to the medical uh, chamber, the Lekashka Komora. And you can have an autonomous organization that answers to the profession, answers to government, answers to the universities. For example, in Australia, the regulation of medical schools is by the Australian Medical Council, which is completely independent, autonomous, and yet it does its job so efficiently that everyone is confident in, its, um, uh, in, it, in the outcome of what it does. For how long have we had regulation of the medical profession? Well, um, certainly for 2000 years. I'll give you an example in a minute. But I will also talk about how do we verify that regulators are working in the right way? If you like, the regulator verifies that the medical school is performing adequately, but how do we verify that the regulator is performing adequately? Next slide, please. Um, a little bit of history from 2000 years ago. And this is a marketplace in Egypt in the times of the Roman Empire. And we have a letter where the new doctor has described how he wishes to use space in the marketplace to open a clinic, to open his medical practice. And we know that he was examined by the manager of the market. And the manager asked, where was he educated? Who were his teachers? What is the evidence that he's got that he's competent? Now, there we had a system of regulation of verifying that the education was adequate. We know that the system worked because the young doctor was writing to his mother. Very often a new doctor has who has uh, his or her first job will write home to their mother. Um, but it's a system that shows that even 2000 years ago, we had something like this. Next slide, I think we have a picture. Yes, there is a picture of a Roman marketplace. Um, next slide, please. If we bring history closer to uh, the last 500 years or so, well, um, uh, in uh, England, in the United Kingdom, the, the King Henry VIII established the Royal College of Physicians of London. And this was to grant a license to those qualified to practice and to punish those who were unqualified and who were practicing badly. And the Royal College of Physicians is still there. I'm a fellow of it, and that's what I put an important part of my license to practice uh, medicine in uh, the UK. And I think we have next, we have a picture. Yes, there is Henry VIII. So he knew that it was important to regulate medicine. Next, please, if we take things back on to 150 years ago, this is when the General Medical Council, the General Council of Medical Education and Registration was established in the UK. And this was at a time when medical schools were sometimes quite incompetent. And it was important to establish that someone who said he or she, usually he in those days, was a doctor, were they properly qualified? And after the, medical count, the General Medical Council was established, almost half of all the medical schools in the UK uh, closed. In other words, there was a lot of poor quality teaching and a proper regulator cleared it away. 
next, just another date, uh, 110 years ago in the United States, Abraham Flexner, we have his picture, please. Thank you. There is Abraham Flexner wrote his report on medical education in the United States and Canada. And he had almost exactly the same effect as the General Medical Council had had uh, in uh, the UK, that half of all the medical schools closed. And um, next slide, please. Um, uh, next. Uh, after Flexner, there was an emphasis on how uh, medicine should have the scientific basis of medicine taught. And uh, it had all sorts of other important detail, in particular saying that the medical school must have a role in making sure the teaching hospital works well, and the teaching hospital must have a role in making sure that the medical school is effective. And if we bring things up very close to present time, the General Medical Council uh, produced uh, uh, the document describing how medical schools work called the Doctors of Tomorrow, Tomorrow's Doctors. The first was nearly 30 years ago, and a, a very good book indeed. Ne I think I have a picture here as well. Next. Yes, there we are. This is uh, the cover of Flexner's report on medical education in the United States and Canada. It's a long document, but well worth reading it. It, it uh, describes how a medical school really should work and describes some of the horrifying things that Abraham Flexner found. Uh, next slide, please. Now, this is about, um, as I say, we're interested in regulation, and this is about the role of the World Federation in looking at regulators of medical education and recognising whether accrediting agencies um, are working uh, efficiently. Um, why did it start? Well, we started because we were aware that in many parts of the world, the accreditation system is poor or very, very poor indeed. Um, I think uh, the worst that I know is one country in uh, South, Southern America, I won't say which one, where if you wish to have your medical school accredited, you go and see the Minister of Health, and the Minister of Health says, of course, we can accredit your medical school. Put $100,000 in my hand, and I will write you the certificate. That's not a good system for ensuring that education is of uh, a good quality. So uh, on the next point, if something like this is to be measured, the quality of medical schools, we need that, to be sure that the measurement tool is accurate. And the main reason, this quotation is on our, from our website, the main reason for accreditation of medical schools is to enhance the quality of medical education by verifying that medical schools are competent in the delivery of education and that medical education programs are suitable. And the ultimate purpose, of course, is that medical schools are educating doctors fit to serve the needs of the population they serve. So next slide, please. Um, we agreed guidelines for the accreditation of medical education uh, more than 15 years ago with the World Health Organization at a very detailed meeting in Moldova. And uh, uh, that established how the accreditation should be done and how it should be checked. But there was an extra stimulus that in 2010, 11 years ago, the Educational Commission for Foreign Medical Graduates in the United States said that if you wish to work as a doctor in the United States, after a particular deadline, which is now three years from now, you would have to have come from a medical school accredited and accredited to standards such as those of the World Federation. So ever since then, we've been running a program for verification of the quality of accrediting agencies and to verify that they are working at a good level. And the next slide, the next slide, thank you, shows that countries where there are regulators recognized by the World Federation. Some are very obvious, uh, for example, the United States and Canada with long established systems, Australia and so on. Um, there are some countries with 
only one regulator that may work in only a few medical schools. So there is one regulator uh, based in Kazakhstan, which is recognized and has the right to operate in Russia. But I think they are not going to be very important ultimately for the accreditation of most medical schools. But we are working with another agency, uh, which uh, certainly has authority from the ministry. And we hope that they will be assessed and verified as uh, uh, working efficiently in the near future. The dark blue parts of the slide are places where we have already uh, established that accrediting agencies work very well. The light blue colors are where we have agencies that have applied and will be assessed in the very near future. And you will see that agencies that are recognized are not all in rich and uh, um, uh, very advanced economies. Of course, we have verified the agencies in Japan, say, or in, um, uh, in Ireland, but uh, there are countries like Egypt, the Sudan, Indonesia, where there is not a lot of wealth, but there is actually a very good system, a very good system for verifying that medical schools work very well. This is a very rigorous process. And of all the agencies we've assessed, you can see that there's well over 20 on the screen, uh, of all the agencies that we've assessed, only three went through the system with um, uh, no criticisms, nothing that they had to correct. As I say, I won't say where those three are. One was from a very wealthy, rather westernized country. One was from a middle income country with a very large system, but working very well. And one was from a very poor third world country, but nevertheless, higher education and the education of doctors in that country was very well uh, managed. So I think we I hope we are getting a system that will uh, produce confidence in the standards of medical education worldwide. Next slide, please. Let's talk about the role of society in supporting education. Uh, obviously, in the end, we are educating doctors because they are going to serve society. Uh, so it is very important that the interaction works well. Next slide, please. And in the interaction between doctors and society, there is a consensus document uh, which talks about the relationship, the global consensus on the social accountability of medical schools. We were an active member of the group that wrote this and were very pleased to be involved, but we had one or two concerns. Uh, next slide, please. There is uh, the cover of the document. Um, but on the next slide, I list our concerns. Um, should it be accountability or responsibility or responsiveness? Are you accountable to society? Do you do what they tell you? Are you responsible for the role in society? Or is the responsiveness, is it a matter of dialogue? Uh, accountability in, in English, in British English, sounds uh, very... Uh, firm. It's the same thing that says you must do this. And uh, we prefer, certainly much prefer to feel that society is not just telling doctors what to do, that medicine is a profession. It has that specialized knowledge that I talked about earlier on. And that knowledge and expertise must be used to work with society to achieve the uh, necessary result. And if we say that social accountability is the only thing we have to do, then you might say, well, the professional um, uh, uh, nature of medicine is being uh, reduced. So on the next slide, please. Um, I've got all those um, uh, things listed. The medical student at the start, the doctor in the profession at the end, and the, his or her teachers, the administration, the rector, the healthcare system, the regulator and society. And I think it's important to recognize, as I have in the title, that students have a powerful influence, have potentially a very powerful influence on all of these. And that's right, because medical schools are universities and they are not schools where someone just tells you what to do. Their university is a community of teachers and students working together to get the right result. 
certainly for your teachers, then feedback between teacher and student both ways is very important to achieve the best result. And indeed, um, there is good evidence that the more that students have some uh, freedom on the, the balance of the subjects they study, then they get a better result. That's another a subject for another time. As I've mentioned, the dean and the administrative structure of the medical school is of the first importance, because if that does not work well, if the relationship with the politicians or the money uh, fails, then the medical school will fail. And so it's very important that the student body is very supportive of the rector and the work that the administration is doing. In the healthcare system, well, we are studying to be doctors to improve healthcare. So actually, while studying in the healthcare system and contributing to it, uh, there should be feedback. And as I've already said, the influence of students on the healthcare system is very profound. If you have medical students in a hospital, then we know that the hospital is actually more efficient in the care of patients. You might argue that students have very little effect on the regulator. This varies from country to country, but when we go and look at an accrediting agency, at a regulator, we actually make sure that when they are evaluating a medical school, they look at the student experience, not just at what the teachers say about the school. And indeed, in many countries, in Western countries like Australia or the United Kingdom, the team from the regulator will very often include a student. And indeed, uh, that may be the case in some um, in other countries a long way away from the Western tradition. In Kazakhstan, a medical school is assessed by a team, including a medical student. And the medical student may have a role in making sure that the regulator on that particular visit or in general is asking the right questions. And uh, in society, of course, medicine is a profound influence on the way that society works. And as I say, the responsiveness, the interaction between the profession and society is of uh, the first importance. Now, in terms of our interaction with society, we have, of course, the particular problem of the current pandemic crisis. And I have three slides just pointing out things that uh, have emerged during that. Next slide, please. This is a, 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 an extract from a report in the Guardian newspaper in the UK um, back uh, about nine months ago. And someone from Imperial College, uh, London, a very good medical school, um, uh, said that they had an innovative method of teaching. And he said that they had tried to minimize the risk of infection by preventing anyone who does not need to be in the hospital from being there. And th th he was talking about a method of teaching over the internet, uh, but teaching the clinical skills, and the quotation at the final paragraph says, the pandemic resulted in the first time in living memory that medical education has been truly limited by having no access at all to patients. Now, I personally think this is complete nonsense. You cannot have education of students right to the time that they qualify without them actually seeing a patient. They've got to see a patient sometime. Do they see patients for the first time after they qualify? Um, and indeed, in history, in other times of crisis, as far as I can tell, there has never been a circumstance where med some medical schools have excluded medical students completely from clinical experience. Um, the crises, uh, the, the, the Great War of 75 years ago, medical students uh, were active, often running hospitals. Uh, in the cholera epidemic uh, 120 years ago, um, uh, there were medical students working in hospitals in Germany and doing their best to try and save people with cholera um, uh, in smallpox epidemics before then. So we have a great deal of experience of students working in hospitals, studying, and helping with the care of patients, uh, even under the most difficult circumstances. So my next two slides are my own feeling much more positively. 
This one, uh, the heading is the role of medical students during the COVID-19 pandemic, and it's from the Annals of Internal Medicine. And it says that the American Association of Medical Schools has said to medical schools that they must uh, suspend the teaching, clinical teaching of students and that we advise that medical students should not be involved in direct care. And these authors, uh, writing from uh, one of the major medical schools, said, we disagree. Medical students should have clinical opportunities that will benefit patient care, prevent workforce shortages, and students will learn. And on the next slide, a rather more um, uh, philosophical approach where the authors writing in the Wisconsin Medical Journal say that a few times in each generation there are crises and this is one that we must get hold of. Because we are healthcare professionals, we seek opportunities to help patients and colleagues, even though it is safer to stay at home. Our instinct is to run towards danger and terrifying and uncertain situations rather than running away and that's part of the character and education and training of a doctor. When we were students, we saw our own teachers not hesitate to deal with a patient where things were going to be difficult. And students already are showing that they have that instinct. And it's up to the medical school and the students together to develop safe, meaningful, and life affirming uh, opportunities to serve. Our goal is to work together to find ways as safely as possible to integrate students into the system. And medical educators should use the pandemic as a teaching moment while also providing appropriate, compassionate, character-driven and competent care as far as possible. So I personally subscribe to that. We cannot teach in the normal way in a teaching hospital if the virus is rampant there, but we have to teach as safely as possible and uh, we have to certainly recognize that students must gain experience with the care of patients before they qualify. So to conclude, next slide please. I think we should recognize that we are in the worst international crisis for the next, for the last 75 years. Medicine, medical education have survived before and will survive worse crises and we must survive this one. And a quotation, next please, that to say that opinions have caused more trouble in this planet than all the plagues that have been. Opinions can be the most dangerous thing, not disease. Uh, and that quotation next is from Voltaire, writing a very long time ago. And next, uh, we have a picture of Voltaire standing in the center of Ferney Voltaire in France, and Ferney Voltaire is where the World Federation has its office, and we are pleased to follow uh, his more sensible um, philosophical uh, thoughts. So thank you. I hope that that has been of interest. I think we have a little time for questions, if those are useful. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, it was very interesting and well, I just got fascinated, so I can't figure my thoughts right now. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, well, regarding the questions, unfortunately, as I mentioned, we had the connection error. So I don't think we will have live questions from the listeners. Maybe we'll have later and I can forward them to you if you don't mind. But of I course. have a question, honestly, uh, which is maybe a little bit more specific to what WFME does. And we'll, um, I don't know, maybe we can discuss this later, but I was curious about uh, two facts when you showed the map of the accreditation offices uh, accredited by WFME. I noticed that there is none in the UK and I noticed that there is one in Russia. Um, I, 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 I got a question, why don't you have one in the UK, yes. if, if I'm allowed to ask? Of course, that's a very good question. Um, of course, there is a regulator in the, the UK, the General Medical Council, which has been operating ever since 1858. Um, and they know that they need to come in to be recognized. Um, there has been a little bit of internal discussion 
within the General Medical Council about their approach uh, to come to the World Federation to be recognized, uh, but they will do so in the next uh, year or two. Okay. I think one of the issues uh, has been um, how important is this? Is it important to do? And I think my own view is that it's very important to look not just at the regulator in less developed countries like the Sudan or um, I'm trying to think of a good uh, um, example uh, in, in, in uh, uh, Kyrgyzstan or wherever. It's important to look at the regulator, not just in the less developed countries, to look at the regulators in the most developed countries like the United States. There would be something quite discriminatory to not look at regulation everywhere, because if you assume that um, every reg regulators that are well established and have been going for many years are all right, then you may make mistakes. My colleagues in the United States will not mind me saying, because uh, they know I say it, but when we evaluated the USA agency, the Liaison Committee on Medical Education, our team picked out a few things that we thought could be improved. And their response was, how interesting. We did not realize that we were not doing this as well as we could. We will now change and improve. So even in highly developed countries, um, there can be things that can be improved. As I say, there are only three countries uh, that were sailed through with no, nothing to be changed. Um, and you don't have to be rich or long established to produce a perfect or near perfect system. Um, it's true also to, to generalize a little more that Western Europe has been one of the slowest uh, areas of the world to actually um, uh, come in for recognition. But we have now um, approaches in Germany, Switzerland, Italy, Spain, uh, many other countries. So that is now falling into place. The other area on that map that has relatively little coloured in is Africa. But within Africa, um, covering large parts of the country of the continent, there are organisations that work between several countries. There is a consortium in West Africa that deals with the very big medical countries like Nigeria, Ghana and so on. There is a consortium of regulators in the east of Africa that deals with Eastern African countries, Ethiopia, Kenya, um, uh, 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 Tanzania, Zimbabwe and so on. There is also a French speaking organization, CIDMEF, uh, uh, which uh, deals with the French speaking countries. So that covers a very wide range of countries. And when those three organizations have been recognized, most of the Africa map will turn dark blue. OK, thank you very much for answering the question and for your very valuable comments and uh, immensely valuable information. And I think uh, we can finish for now. I'm, I'm just stopping the screen sharing process. And once again, thank you very much for giving us this honor of presenting the lecture and attending us yesterday at the workshop as well. We hope that our communication will become warmer and closer in the future as well. Thank you very much. Well, it's been a great pleasure. I've enjoyed preparing the talk and thinking about it. And actually, I've enjoyed also uh, delivering it and also the meeting yesterday. So uh, I will sign off now, but I will look forward to any Thanks. further communication. And I'm, of course, happy to answer any questions uh, as they come up. Thank you very much, Professor. Goodbye. Uh, Have a nice day. And you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Продолжаем наше пленарное заседание, и слово об итогах 15-й всероссийской 89-й итоговой студенческой научной конференции предоставляется председателю студенческого научного общества Виктория Давыдовна Савана. Пожалуйста, Виктория Давыдовна. Добрый день, глубоко уважаемый Игорь Леонидович, глубоко уважаемые участники 
пленарного заседания зрители. Действительно, конференция состоялась вчера с новым онлайн-форматом. Были и трудности, были и новые возможности, которые предоставляет нам онлайн, то есть доступ из любой точки мира. И мы постарались воспользоваться этой возможностью по максимуму, пригласив к нам участников, как уже было сказано, из всех уголков нашей земли, с нашей страны. Но, дабы не затягивать, позвольте огласить результаты сегодняшнего, точнее, уже вчерашнего заседания по секционно. Прежде чем огласить имена победителей, необходимо напомнить, что каждый год у нас студенческие научные кружки, которые по тематике направлений и специализации объединены в сектора студенческого научного общества, соревнуются за звание лучшего студенческого научного кружка в своем секторе. И в 2020-2011 учебном году победители были определены, посчитаны и представлены на слайде. Озвучу. Сектор терапии. Студенческий научный кружок кафедры госпитальной терапии с курсами поликлинической терапии и трансфузиологии. Сектор хирургия. Кружок кафедры оперативной хирургии и клинической анатомии с курсом инновационных технологий. Сектор педиатрия. СНК кафедры факультетской педиатрии. Сектор фармации. СНК кафедры фармакогнозии с ботаникой и основами фитотерапии. Сектор стоматология. Студенческий научный кружок кафедры стоматологии детского возраста и ортодонтии. Сектор клиническая медицина номер один СНК кафедры от Арины Ларингологии имени Академика Солдатова. Сектор клиническая медицина номер два СНК кафедра акушерства и гинекологии номер два. Сектор профилактическая медицина СНК кафедра гигиены и питания с курсом гигиены детей и подростков. Сектор фундаментальные науки, студенческий научный кружок кафедры общей и клинической патологии, патологической анатомии и патологической физиологии. И, наконец, сектор гуманитарной науки, студенческий научный кружок кафедры философии и культурологии. Итак, секция номер один. Первая терапевтическая секция. Первое место – Власова Богуслава, Джураев Бахтовар, Курбанбаева Шахноза. Второе место разделили Друзин Анатолий и Мамедова Аида, Нафиева Динара из Казанского государственного медицинского университета. Третье место – Абашкина Анастасия, Серова Анастасия. Лучший постерный доклад – Липина Ольга, Джураев Бахтовар. Секция номер два, вторая терапевтическая секция. Первое место – Шацкая Полина. Второе место – Курчугина Наталья, Шафиев Олег, Шафиева Алена. Третье место – студенты Казанского государственного медицинского университета Гайсина Диана Фатыхова Алина, студенты Рязанского государственного медицинского университета имени академика Павлова Ежова Анастасия, Симкова Лилия, Богданович Игорь. Студенты Мордовского государственного университета имени Огарева, Шерманкина Марина. Лучший постерный доклад Хайрулова Регина и Годовикова Лиза. Третья секция, первая хирургическая. Первое место Комлева Ярослава, Остачая Полина. Второе место Черепанов Всеволод. Третье место Жданова Анастасия. Секция номер четыре, вторая хирургическая секция. Первое место Анастасия Землякова. Второе место Охотникова Валерия, Власова Богуслава, Капаева Нина. Третье место Портнова Елизавета и лучшим постерным докладом признан доклад Капаева и Нины и Косолапова Алексея. Секция номер пять. Первая секция клинической медицины. Первое место Лина Галяудинова. Второе место Репина Дарья. Третье место Михаил Давыдкин Гогель. И также третье место Ксения Моисеева. Секция номер шесть. Вторая секция клинической медицины. Первое место Гуляева Татьяна, Пиунов Артем. Второе место Галтеева Дарья, Биденко Ольга. Третье место Глазунова Анна, Манжасина Ульяна. Секция номер семь. Проблемы стоматологии. Первое место Ретонин Максим, Челнова Софья. Второе место Карина Сукасян, Русакова Ксения. Второе место Морина Александра. Третье место Терсенева Ксения. Лучший постерным докладом признан доклад Елизаветы Емелиной. Секция номер восемь. Проблема педиатрии. Первое место Беденко Ольга. Второе место студентки Саратовского государственного медицинского университета имени Разумовского Ольга Логачева, Альфия Тараканова. Третье место студентка Рязанского государственного медицинского университета имени Павлова Захарова Анастасия. Третье место Юлиана Сережкина. Лучший постерный доклад Анастасия Залата. Секция номер девять. Проблема акушерства и гинекологии. Первое место Валентина Синякина. Второе место Юлия Дорофеева, Патимат Магомедова, студентка Российского национального исследовательского медицинского университета имени Пирогова, Москва. Третье место Анастасия Чеколовец и лучший постерный доклад Анастасия Медведская. 
Секта номер 10. Проблема репродуктивной медицины. Первое место. Даниил Кокарев, Сабанцева Мария, Карпова Мария. Второе место. Валентина Минеева. Третье место. Юлия Мальчикова. Лучший постерный доклад. Мария Майорова. Секция номер 11. Проблема фармации и фармакологии. Первое место. Карина Храбрая. Второе место. Вероника Нестерова. Третье место. Никита Соколов. Лучший постерный доклад. Валерия Клевачева. Даниил Карзанов. Секция номер 12. Проблема психиатрии и психологии. Первое место. Эвелина Бралгина, Елизавета Бралгина. Второе место. Софья Орлова, Инна Тамразян. Третье место. Алина Загуменова, Ксения Конина. Секция номер 13. Проблема морфологии. Первое место. Вадим Корнилов. Второе место. Юлия Мальчикова. Третье место. Анастасия Новикова и Диана Алькова. Лучший постерный доклад. Григорий Давыдкин. Секция номер 14. Проблема патологии. Первое место Анастасия Чебыкина. Второе место Золотарева Виктория, Сиденкова Дарья. Третье место Русакова Ксения, Власова Богуслава, Джураев Бахтовар, Липина Ольга. Лучший постерный доклад Захаров Илья. Секция номер 15. Секция фундаментальной медицины. Первое место Ремезов Василий. Второе место Ведение на Арсений. Второе место Горшков Дмитрий. Третье место. Студенты Рязанского государственного медицинского университета имени Академика Павлова, Керимов Ибрагим, Шевченко Виктор. Третье место. Невидомская Полина, Гридаева Анастасия, Шарфудинова Ирина. Секция номер 16. Секция профилактической медицины. Первое место. Кристина Емельянова. Второе место. Анастасия Кулагина, Аркадий Лившиц, Варвара Мухам... Мухортова. Третье место. Артем Муравицкий, Вячеслав Пескун. Екатерина Исаева. Лучший постерный доклад Александра Урих и Екатерина Косинова. Секция номер 17. IT-технологии в медицине. Первое место. Вероника Верясова, Нина Копаева, Алексей Косолапов. Второе место. Кристина Желинская, Александр Сутягин, Вячеслав Пескун. Третье место. Руслан Идиатулин, Арсений Веденин. Лучший постерный доклад Анастасия Буренкова, Павел Шулепов. Секция номер 18. Гуманитарные науки. Первое место Ксения Каримова. Второе место Полина Машутина, Анастасия Абашкина, Ирина Кузнецова. Третье место Георгий Катков, Мария Головина. Лучший постерный доклад Виктория Тарасова. Секция номер 19. Проблема сестринского дела. Первое место Снежанна Ильина. Второе место студенты Саратовского государственного медицинского университета имени Разумовского Ольга Ерошина, Максим Полиданов и Кристина Ситникова, а также студентка САМГМУ Анастасия Шитова. Третье место Руслана Журавлева, Мария Жилкина. Лучший постерный доклад Айгуль Азелькиреева. Секция номер 20, секция «Юный медик», которая проходила в офлайн формате с соблюдением всех санитарно-эпидемиологических требований. Школьники посетили наш университет, посетили экскурсию, и мы получили восторженные отзывы и желание данных ребят, это ребята от 7 до 11 класса, продолжать заниматься научной деятельностью, уже будучи студентами Самарского государственного медицинского университета. На сегодняшний день их результаты деятельности – представлены на слайде. И первое место занимает ученица Самарского регионального центра для одаренных детей Мария Агледдинова. Второе место ученица гимназии номер один базовой школы РАН и э, Ульяна Коза Казарезова. Второе место Кристина Хныкина, ученица лицея созвездия номер 131. Третье место Александра Бобова, Влада Бобова, лицей классический, СМИД IT-медицина. Третье место Никита Быков, ученик школы номер 6 с углубленным изучением отдельных предметов имени Ломоносова. И третье место Олег Маслов, школа номер 175. Секция докладов на английском языке. 21-я секция. Первое место Аравинд Гумади, Тбилиси, Грузия. Второе место Елена Захарова, Самара. Второе место Альфред Шабу, Кармен Аль-Хадад, из Бейрута, Ливан. Третье место Карен Арлет. Рувалкаба Петроза, Гвадалахара, Мексика. И третье место Дарья Бывшего, Самара, Россия. И Полина Маслова, Самара, Россия. На этом результаты работы секционных заседаний подведены. Мы поздравляем всех победителей, желаем их дальнейших успехов. И позвольте анонсировать, что 
те конкурсы, которые у нас проходили в, в социальных сетях на протяжении двух последних недель, это конкурсы на лучший студенческий научный кружок, на лучшую стенгазету и на лучший видеоролик. По результатам зрительского голосования результаты вы можете найти на странице группы «Снов ВКонтакте». А по результатам оценки экспертных судей мы огласим чуть позже в связи с дистанционным форматом оценки данных работ, и сегодня будут подведены все результаты. Просим вас следить за обновлениями в группе «Сно», где все это будет анонсировано. Благодарю за внимание. Ну что ж, спасибо, спасибо Виктория Давыдовна. И как бы завершаем наше сегодняшнее пленарное заседание. Хочется подчеркнуть, что... Конечно, есть победители, которые сейчас были озвучены Викторией Давыдовной, но мы считаем, что все участники конференции, 89-й итоговой студенческой научной конференции, все являются победителями. И мы благодарим и наших дорогих студентов, и школьников из гимназий и школ, и наших дорогих преподавателей, научных руководителей за помощь, за организацию, за прекрасные презентации ваших учеников. И мы надеемся, что несмотря на то, что будет ли третья волна, не будет третьей волны пандемии, все наши молодые ученые продолжат заниматься научно-исследовательской работой, будут публиковать свои работы в ведущих журналах российских в будущем, в международных журналах. Все это будет, я надеюсь, реализуется в кандидатские и докторские диссертации. Неважно, где будут работать в будущем наш выпускник или в практическом здравоохранении, или в университете. Мы надеемся, что участие в подобной конференции дает вам неоценимые знания и компетенции, которые вы в дальнейшем будете использовать в своей деятельности. Ну и, конечно же, мы ждем ваши доклады, ваши работы на следующей нашей юбилейной 90 итоговой студенческой научной конференции. Всем хорошего дня, спасибо за внимание и всего самого хорошего. До свидания. До новых встреч.